Good evening. Welcome. This is Ryan Miller for Parent Dome, where I am hosting the Internet Safe Kids Show. This is episode number two. So um, what I would like to do is first offer that um, I am dealing with a very difficult topic about speaking how to keep kids safe on the Internet. And I talk about three topic areas, awareness, oversight, and controls. And because I am so passionate about my topic area, some of the things I say may not come out the way I intend them to because I'm very passionate. So I want to offer an apology in advance that my goal is to not offer any value-based judgment regarding parents' parenting dynamics, the relationship with their children, what their objectives are. I don't want anybody to perceive anything that I say in a negative light. This is all about a conversation that I'm having with caregivers of children on how to make their own decisions based upon, as I increase awareness, talking about awareness and oversight and controls, what is appropriate for you in your relationship with children based upon the desired outcome you would like in a, in a child. So if anything that I say along the way comes off as being judgmental, that is not my intention at all. It's a conversation to help parents in becoming how to keep their kids safe on the internet. The other thing I want to offer is a disclaimer that I'm going to go into uh, my presentation this evening a little bit about my background that gives me the credibility to uh, have the authority to speak on this topic. But relative to the credentials of the things that I talk about, I am not a lawyer. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a law enforcement person. A lot of the things that I talk about will cross into those domains and competencies, and the, the basis on which I'm making my statements about them are based upon multiple uh, interviews that I've conducted, research that I've done, uh, actual papers that I've downloaded and researched, and I am paraphrasing some of the documented research and study that I have done. So the disclaimer is I'm not offering legal advice because I'm not an attorney. I may provide historical references to case law and things that have happened in the law in various states or federal law. Uh, I may talk about the psychology and the way brain processes things. But again, I'm not a medical doctor nor a clinician, but that's based upon my research. So those are the framework. That's the framework that I'm coming from. So um, please understand that I didn't don't look at what I'm saying as being judgmental. And also, I'm not coming from that authoritative standpoint that I have these credentials behind me. So what I would thought I would do last time I was talking about this epidemic that was happening in across our country today about sexting, which is a very it's a very important topic and it continues to be a problem. And later in the episode, I'm going to talk about something that's even a little bit more severe that just recently happened that is um, has got the same virility, viralness as sexting does. But I wanted you to get a more personal glimpse into who I am and what has been my journey to form this in me that I am so passionate about it. And this, this is kind of a personal journey, a personal story. And I'm not going to go through my entire journey because there's multiple milestones that have happened in my life that have formed this. So in the next episode, I'll take you another uh, step along my journey. In the third episode, I'll give you another step along the journey. And you'll see how this package of my life has kind of driven me into this focus of this area. And honestly, it hasn't really come into this kind of clarity for the last couple of years. Uh, the last couple of years, it's become crystal clear, but I knew it, I, I was tuned into the forming of how it was happening in my life, and I'm gonna share that with you now. So this is personal. Um, some of it, it's difficult for me to tell so, and I am a kind of an emotional person. I wear them on my sleeve. So I, if I emote, that's just part of who I am. So <clears throat> I grew up in a middle-class family, uh, raised in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. 
And when I was around eight or nine years old, we were plunked up out of the Pine Barrens and we were moved into rural Pennsylvania. And during there, it was in the awkward time, eight, nine, 10 years old, that it was a little unusual to reestablish new friends. But I, I reached out and I built a new set of friends being transplanted. My parents um, thought it would be very good for me to be involved in sporting programs, to be involved in scouting. And during this time of my life, I had experienced um, the negative consequences of being, a sec being sexually abused. Uh, through, through the scouting experience, I was a victim of sexual abuse. This is very unusual in that most sexual abuse has been identified to happen with family members. I'm pleased to say it was none of my family members. It was related to scouting. And it happened for an extended period of time. And with a young mind, I wasn't sure how to handle that. And it, it affected me, it affected me through uh, junior high school, through high school. My parents, I never told my parents about it. Didn't come out until I was in my 20s that they even knew that this happened. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Somebody's going to poke at me that I might cry. So um, during my teen years, this was something that I held on to me and made me aware of an element of my personality that it, you, you go through this questioning process. And it took me a while that I was, I was a, an ADD child. I had challenges in the, the academic programs and schools, and I went to psychologists to, to help me as I was going through this process. And it was, it was a, a challenging time in my life. Um, but I was able to come out of the high school experience with an awareness that this trauma did something to me, but it did something to me that I was going to rise above it. Because one of the things that my parents instilled in me was this power of resilience that at 13 years old, my parents had said to me, Ryan, you're, if you want those nice shoes, you're going to have to work and go afford to, to buy those nice shoes. So I had this in my, my DNA. Um, when I was 13 years old, my grandmother passed away. My grandfather, who was a raging alcoholic, um, took me to Europe for an entire summer where he was passed out in the hotels and I was wandering around Europe by myself. Um, doing things that a 13-year-old boy should not be in the presence of in Amsterdam, in some of the places that I were, wandering around the streets of, of France in the middle of the night. It was, um, I grew up real fast when I was 13, wandering the streets of Europe with my passed out drunk grandfather, having to carry him from place to place. And my mother did not understand to the, the depth my that her father was an alcoholic. But I, this resiliency, created this drive in me that there wasn't anything that I could see as an obstacle. Whenever I saw something, I saw it as something I get over, around, or under. Well, as I was coming out of my high school years, I saw that I was involved in other activities where I would be in a leadership position, whether it be with uh, where I was employed, whether it was in Scott College, uh, employment coming out, that I was kind of like a leader. That was something that I, I had was this capability to lead. And I would get involved in church activities. I would lead Sunday school groups or youth groups. And all of a sudden, I got this visibility when I was interacting with children through sports or through ministry that these kids, I could sense that they were victims of something bad. Now, I wouldn't say I could identify it would be sexual or physical, but they were victims. And that gave me the ability to see this lens that I would help them through this process to the point where I would counsel them to the point where they could confide in me that I could get them in relationship to another counselor. So that was not crystal clear for me until I was much older that I could look back and see that that happened in my life. So I'm gonna fast forward a number of years where my career went up and down and up and down, and I, I had developed a technology, and I think I shared this on the last broadcast, that I was sued for several millions of dollars based upon a technology I built and had death threats from my family and had to leave our home. It was a pretty catastrophic time in our life. And my, my job as a parent was to keep my 
family safe, my wife and my daughter safe. So during this period, I went, I was afforded a, a job after I lost everything. I was given a job in a hobby that I like in technology, home theater, audio uh, design. And I was out doing a consultation at a home and I'm meeting with the husband and wife. And we're talking about this beautiful home theater design studio that we're going to do down in their basement. And we're having a great conversation about this, that hardware, back and forth. And the, the meeting was interrupted. The daughter comes down the steps and there was an interaction between the daughter and the, the family. And I noticed some friction during that conversation. This is where the emotion part comes in. So the, the minor discussion, the daughter leaves. I see the tension in the family. And I look at the family and I'm sitting here at this point that I am working to make a living to feed my family. That's what my job is. And I notice this friction happening between the daughter and the parents. And I look, I'm thinking to myself, Ryan, you got a decision to make. Do you want to probe into these, this family's personal life or do you just want to stay focused on the job at hand? And I got a tap on my shoulder and said, do what's natural to you, Ryan, do what's natural. And I said, I said to the couple, I said, I apologize, this is probably none of my business, but I, I noticed some conflict here between you and your child. Is everything okay? Do I need to leave? I, I'd be pleased to go and we can reschedule this. And the mom said, yeah, w there was a little conflict. Our daughter has been getting more withdrawal from us and she's spending more time in her room. She's spending more time behind the computer we're not able to see what she's doing on the computer. She's hiding things from us. I was like, oh my goodness. So I got another tap on the shoulder and I, this is <laughs> not an actual tab, but I'm like, well, I mean, if you, if you were interested in talking about it, I'm pretty familiar with technology. And if, if you want to, I'd be willing to talk to you about how I can help you look at things to help control the technology. So it's not, you having an argument with your daughter, but setting up things on your computer that make the computer be the enemy, not you be the enemy, and you can work to get her off of that computer. And she said, and the husband looked at me, what are you talking about? I said, well, I can do things on the laptops or I can do things on your router that can give you visibility as to what she's seeing. I can help you shut down, put time parameters on there. I can put restrictions on there as to where she can and cannot go to keep her safe. And they said, oh my, Gosh, I mean, that would be fabulous. So they said, could you do that tonight? I said, absolutely. So we went into their computers. We went to, actually went down to the router first and I configured the router, added some software to it and gated off the router as to what can come in and what can go out. And then they wanted me to do something on the PCs. And I, and I said, would you like me to help you have a conversation with your daughter as to what we're doing here? And they said, that's really unusual, but if you wouldn't mind, that would be really helpful because you'd be like a soft interface for what's happening here and you can kind of be the fall guy if it goes off the rails. And I said, I would be pleased to do that. So they called their daughter and this, this young girl is 13 years old, 13 years old. So the young girl comes down and I say, hi, my name's Mr. Miller. I've been talking to your parents about the, the home theater, but we really got into a conversation about their total connected experience in the home. And they shared some things with me that had them concerned, that, that they expressed as concern. And I've been kind of working with them on how to better protect you. Because they had some fears that you might be doing something on the internet or things happening on the internet that they weren't able to see that could be maybe dangerous. All right, here we go. So she looks at her parents and she looks at me and she said, I'm scared to death. There's some really bad stuff happening on the internet. I don't know how to get away from it. There's people that are threatening me. There are people who are saying really bad things about me and I can't get them to stop. Um, I don't want to tell my mom and dad because I don't know what to do. I'm embarrassed. And, and the mom and dad are freaking out. And I'm like, how bad is this? So I said, they, your parents love you and they want to keep you safe, but they don't know what to do. And I'm here, I'm a stranger, but I want to keep you safe too.
but I also don't want to crush your little spirit and your relationships that you have on the internet, but we want to keep you safe. So she said, Mr. Miller, can you come up to my computer and can you help make this go away? So I go up to the computer up with the parents and she asked her parents to step out of the room because she was embarrassed. She didn't want her parents to see what was on there. And I told her, there's nothing, I don't want to see anything that, that if you don't want your parents to see it, I don't want to see it. If there's things that are personal and private, I don't want to see it either. But if you want to show me things that people are saying to you, I want to make it go away. And she said, that's what I want to do. So she pulled up a YouTube file of a video that she made, which was a cute little video. And then she showed me the comments. And then the comments that were coming from her other social media identification. She had a social media presence on Ask FM, Instagram, and uh, Kick. Those are the three applications that she had stuff. So this vile, repulsive, disgusting barrage of four-letter word commentary was flooding this young kid on all media fronts. And she couldn't disengage from it because it was a tidal wave of strangers, of people that she knew from her school, and she's crying. And I said, sweetie, this, none of this is true. None of what you see here is true. This is just mean, hateful people trying to cause you harm just for entertainment. And we're going to make them go away. I'm going to make the whole thing go away. But what I want to do is that I want to, once we make this all go away, we're going to come back and have a conversation with your parents to make this a better thing because I don't want you to not be able to use the computer, but we're going to have a way for you to use the computer to keep you safe. And she she was happy with that. So I went through and I did what I did on her computer. And then we came back downstairs and we're having like a family meeting. I'm not part of the family, but at this point I've been there for two and a half hours. I felt like I was part of their family, seeing things that I shouldn't be seeing, but I'm taking care of their daughter. And mom and dad were embarrassed. Mom and dad were incredibly embarrassed. And I'm not the salesman. I'm a salesperson, but I'm a human being. And this little child was in crisis. The parents didn't know. When I talk about awareness, they didn't know. They didn't have an awareness. They saw symptoms. Actually, they saw evidence of symptoms. The evidence was her child was withdrawing from them. The symptom was the trauma that she was getting flooded for, but they didn't see that. They didn't have visibility to see. They saw the evidence, but they didn't see the symptoms. So I came back and we sat back down in their living room and I said, this is really tough because I didn't know what I, I didn't expect to be walking into this. And please, this is, <laughs> This is kind of coming from my spiritual being, not my professional being. My spiritual being is I'm devastated as to what's happened to your daughter. Um, God put me here for a reason. And I don't need to sell you one thing on your home stereo because what I was able to do today with your daughter was much more powerful. And that what could have happened to her could have affected her for the rest of her life. And I said, something happened to me really bad in my life that... I didn't have someone around to rescue me at the right time. And she needed somebody to rescue her. And her parents weren't there. She had no siblings. She was a standalone child. She was a lonely child. So I said, I'm here to rescue you. And I want to help you and your parents put you back on a path that's safe. Um, it's not going to be easy because some of this stuff is going to come back. So. I had a meeting with the parents about how to set up me methods and processes and procedures for how to keep their daughter safe. And it started with me creating a heightened awareness for them to set up a process that they would have oversight on everything their child did. And then using hard, fast controls, such as I did with the router, such as I was going to suggest to them in a subsequent meeting to do on the smartphone and to do with the, the laptop, hard, fast controls. This happened six years ago. <laughs> I didn't know this happened six years ago until I went back to 
I went back to a blog post that I wrote and I needed to pull something out of my blog for another journey that I was doing. And I stumbled across this in my blog post. I was like, holy smokes, I remember that. I remember that intimately what it was when I was working with that family six years ago. Well, I've been on this journey about how to keep kids safe on the Internet with investing time and research and presentations and gathering data. It's been going on for two and a half years now, and my that, that's culminated in an educational platform. And I think I shared last time that I'm not an Internet marketer. That's not me. I'm a guy that's got a passion that wants to help kids, and I want to give tools to parents to help them do that, to help them increase their awareness so they can get the oversight and they can put the controls in place. So that's, that's a personal story of mine that formed in me from a very young age that culminated six years ago with this one pinnacle event. And next time, next episode, I'm going to share how it even came closer into my home that really set me on fire on the path that I had to do something. And that was the springboard that got me out into the public domain that I was doing presentations. And I was overwhelmed when I was doing the presentations that I would present between two, three, four, five hundred people. And after a presentation, the line would be almost the entire audience standing in line, wanting my time to address this problem, that problem, this problem, that problem after an, an hour presentation. And I can't handle 400 people question and answers after a massive presentation and address their individual problems. And that was the catalyst for me to take all of my knowledge and put it into an a, a aggregated area for people to gain access to. So I wanted to give you some transparency about me, um, where I came from, and I'm going to elaborate that more on the next the next episode. But there's something really interesting <clears throat> that... I needed to, uh, I, you, you'll notice I have a different perspective on things and I, I want to share this perspective with you. This past Friday, we had a, a globally impacting event that happened in Paris. It was absolutely atrocious. And again, I'm not going to sit on one side or the other relative to good or bad of that. I have opinions and I have thoughts and I have ideas about all of this, but this is not the, the forum in which I want to express those. But I want to show what my observations were after that event as it relates to what happened in the social media experience, both on the adult front and both on the child front. And it's rather telling because as I go through this example, I want people to kind of reconcile their own behavior based upon what I'm about to share with you. So during this atrocity, the, the world's eyes, attentions focused on Paris. Social media profiles were coming up with uh, avatars and icons with the blue, blanche, et rouge, French flag colors hiding over their, their images to show support of those in Paris. Um, prayers were going in their direction. The um, internet hacktivist group called Anonymous said that we are going to attack the Islamic jihadists on social media and we're going to t take down their Twitter presence because that is one area where ISIS is very prevalent for recruiting. They also said that they're going to go over the social media sexting, excuse me, texting platform that they use, that they were going to go and find their accounts and shut them down. So Anonymous was true to their words. They did that. They struck a mighty blow into the underground black black underground market of the internet terrorist communication under channels they did it now i'm looking at people across the globe and how they're communicating things and how our president's communicating things and what people are saying in response to what the president did or didn't say what he is going to obligate the united states citizens to or not to and what I saw on social media platforms across the globe were people on two different sides of the political spectrum. Those that were saying the United States is a country of compassion and this is what is our foundation and we need to accept whatever quantity of refugees come into our country. Then you had another side of the 
the, the, the commentary, which was that we need to do due diligence in vetting these people before we let person one into coming into here. And then there's a discussion, well, widows and orphans, and then this, this conversation going back and forth. Again, I'm not declaring where I am in this, but when I'm looking at both sides, I'm seeing people's social media walls, particularly on Facebook, blowing up absolutely blowing up. And what I called it, I called it the social media cleaning house experience. Because if you have one person passionate about one side of this equation on what to do with the refugees and another person equally passionate on the other side, and it's happening in a public forum such as Facebook, the emotions get elevated, it gets heated. And if we were to take a pause and see what our own witnessing was of what was happening in the social media experience during that event for the past week, it's been a week, what has that social media experience been? Look at our Facebook walls and look at what people are commenting on other people's Facebook experience or other social media experience. And the, I, I would venture to say that the quantity of removal of friends or uh, breaking of relationships. Now I'm using the term social media friend, that that is not a familial friend, that's a social media friend. They don't have the same um, emotional attachment. But I'm suggesting that the quantity of those relationships that got severed this past week because of that diverse position and opinion and passion was probably the highest rate of Facebook blocks or Facebook friend defriending to ever happen. When I was watching it happen, I just, I, I could see, and people, it was actually a, a, a comedic thing that people would talk about, oh, I got defriended here, I got blocked here. And it was almost like a challenge as to how often people could get blocked. So now here's the parallel I draw to that. As adults, and we are participating in social media, we have the wisdom and the, the discernment on how to communicate. You know what? I've made a huge mistake, and I apologize for that because I'm supposed to be letting people know how to ask me questions as I'm talking here. Instead of lecturing to you, I should be offering a, a discussion. So um, I apologize. If you would like to uh, call in at 919-518-9773, uh, or you could come in via Skype at Computers2K Voice via Skype, and you can text in questions or comments, and I apologize for being delayed in communicating that. So what I was pointing out as adults when we're communicating in these forums, that we have the wisdom, and we know when, when it's appropriate to disengage, and we know when we may be saying things which are over the top. And we know that the person on the other side has the ability to understand that these are just words and these aren't we can just hit the unfriend button or the block button and be done with it. And there's no permanent damage that is going to happen to an adult based upon these words flowing back and forth. But that behavior that we may be exhibiting is the modeling of behavior which our kids are picking up on. Kids are pretty smart. They know about us things that we don't necessarily want them to know. They know our behaviors. They know our idiosyncrasies. And when we are doing these things on social media that we may be fueling that fire or we may be getting entertainment value from it, but it's still potentially inappropriate, our kids pick up on that. Now the question is, when they pick up on that, are they modeling that behavior in their, social, their own social media experience? So I wanted to draw that comparison because that is the behavior that is happening with children in a very different degree in the social media platform. So there's an interesting side note. Um, I shared about sexting the other day and what happens in the texting of passing of images and or messages through the um, social media applications. I, I, I believe I touched on live streaming the other day, such as things such as Periscope or Meerkat or Uvu or Skype is a, a live streaming vehicle or YouTube has one as well. That tonight as I was going out to dinner, somebody sent me some images that came through my 
Twitter account. This is a person that listens to me on Periscope and is also an advocate for keeping kids safe. And he sent me four screenshots of a live Periscope broadcast. It was a 12-year-old young boy talking into his smartphone. And then there was just the, the comment roll that was going up. If I could turn my, no, I can't. I would, wanted to give you a picture of what that looks like. Oh yeah, I might be able to. Um, won't do that. But in this screenshot, I could see this young boy behind the camera and the comments coming up. And I'm looking at the comments that this young boy is receiving. Now he was just singing songs on Periscope. But there were these anonymous people that came in that were just saying absolutely horrible things. So my buddy who sent me that screenshot asked the kid, do your parents know you're doing this? The kid obviously said, sure, my parents know I'm doing this. Then he asked again, do your parents know what is happening with the comments when you're doing this? And the boy said, no. And he said, do you know that you're telling everybody right now on Periscope exactly where you live? And he's like, I don't care. Go away. 12-year-old boy, his parents put this in their hand, his hands, and he's got no visibility as to what is happening. The parents have no visibility as to what's happening. So I'm going to take this one step further because I did a Periscope on this just the, the other, this week. No, it wasn't this week, it was last week, that I was talking about live streaming and that there was an incident that involved one male and a series of females that they were going to perform a sexual act on this young male. These were all minors. 14 was the oldest and it went down to 11 in a public setting. Not, not public as in a shopping mall, but as public as in a sporting venue, as in the restroom of a sporting venue, where there were no adults in this venue. There was a bit adults around the perimeter, but they were not in the restroom facilities. And the restrooms were like lockers, changing lockers, that you could have a long set of lockers and be hidden in the environment. So what happened was that this one boy was receiving favors from a series of young girls, and it was live streamed. It was a live stream of the boy receiving multiple favors from multiple girls. Not only was it live streamed, it was recorded. So I, I have a friend who has that record who shared this with me, told me about this. And I said, this is the stuff that urban legends are made of, that this was a trend that was reported before that I don't know if this is real. And he says, Ryan, I, I got the, I got the darn tape. I got, I've downloaded the tape. So, um, I talked about this on Periscope and some people said that this isn't real, and I, I had seen a glimpse of the tape. I didn't see the whole tape because I'd, I'm not going to download it. I'm not going to go look at it. It's secured media. And I, after I had the communication with my, the people that follow me on Periscope, I felt I need, to, I need to see if this is really true. I watched 40 seconds of that video before I felt like I had to throw up. And that video now is, went to the police in a flash drive in an encrypted flash drive that he is going to be sending them a password to gain access to that flash drive anonymously. The crazy part is that my friend knew one of the girls in the video and he actually reached out to the parents to make them aware of their daughter being possibly he 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 and I talked about he made before he made this converse before he made this phone call that I said parents don't want to hear this they have no desire to hear it but I said if if I were them I would want to know before the police come knocking on the door so I had say said to him that when you have a conversation with them say it use soft words fuzzy words as I call them it could be it might be it appears to be it might, might be your daughter, but there is this event that took place at this location at this time, at this 
and there were a number of people in there. It is recorded on video. I've seen the video. I saw someone that looks like or could be your daughter, and I, I'm not saying it is, but I think you need to be aware of it because this information is now in the, the hands of the police. So I, and I think I touched on this before, but this is, this is getting, this is a, 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 a real time example of how bad this really is. Because that live streaming example, I talked about that little boy who is live streaming. Their head, some people believe that parents' heads are in the sand, and I think that is an appropriate statement. But assuming kids are safe just by having the education and the conversation is not enough anymore. It's a matter of there's a need to have visibility on what kids are doing. What are they doing on these devices? Have eyes on. So um, I want to give you a, a quick example. There was a social media video. It was called a social media experiment for sexual predators. I think I've talked about this before, but person did these videos. And it talked about how the parents had the conversations with their kids the day before, and he conducted this experiment, and the kids still went out and made poor choices right on the heels of after having this conversation. So many people think once they have the conversation with their kids that these things won't happen. But the reality is we were once kids and that and you could tell us anything you wanted to tell us and we're going to make a decision contrary because we want to express our independence. Well, the permanence of the Internet and technology, it's not just a conversation anymore. You have to have supervision. You have to have eyes on. Before, we could rely on other people watching our children when they're outside of our view, that we would have people reporting to us. Hey, Ryan, I saw your daughter doing this. Hey, Ryan, I saw her meandering with these friends. Well, in the day of the Internet, you don't have any other eyes. When your kid is on here, you have no external eyes to see what they're doing. So it's now up to us to have eyes on what our kid's doing. So it's either we sit behind them as they're on this device all the time, which is not practical. It's, in it's impossible. Or... We set up the mechanisms so that we can see everything that they have done or we have a duplicate of everything that they've done to keep them safe. So in this example, that the story that I'm sharing with you, the, the problem with this hard video now, I'm talking into the legal side now, the parents, the, the children are now, they're going to be... <laughs> That they're going to have a misdemeanor and or a felony charge against them from what they did because of one, the participants in the activity and the two, the recording of the activity. Then you're going to have three, the distribution of that video is another activity. But here's where the head in the sand that someone mentioned really comes into play. That I shared before that this device is under the contract of the parents. So any device that has that video on it is the possession of the parents. Even though the parents put it in the kid's hands, the parents have that contract. And what is at risk here right now is that any one of those parents can be sued by another parent for transmitting child pornography. Because th this is that's what we've got at this point. This is child porn. It's kids involved in a sexual act that are minors that, that that image is being transmitted. So now we've got trend distribution of child porn, and it's the adults that did it. Now, the adults didn't actually do it, but they own the, the legal responsibility for having it done. And they're going to have they're going to have some real problems. Legally, and this is just based upon my own research. Remember my disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. But I've got the research that I've done. I've got the case law, and I've had conversations with the lawyers. And that's one of the things I tell parents when they're involved in these situations. Don't listen to a word I say. Get your own attorney involved in your, your situation if it goes bad. First thing to do, first, first recommendation is don't allow this stuff to happen. Second is get a password on every Bloomin' device that is controlled by the parents. Children have, they don't have their own password. That's, that's, that's a taboo. Parents control all passwords on all digital media, everything. Because in the event 
that you need to exercise your constitutional rights. The only way that a police officer can get access to this device is through a subpoena that you are, you are not compelled to provide them a password to this device. They have to get it, they have to subpoena it for you. So this, this is just, don't believe me, go to attorney. Protect yourself, protect your rights. You want to save your children, you want to save your family from this kind of trauma. And if, if it is illegal, they will serve you with the subpoena, they will gain access to your phone, and they will find that imagery, and then that the, the law is going to go the way the law is going to go. Um, in this situation, the parents who are in ownership of those phones with that media on it, when it goes through the subpoena process and that data is on their phones, it's, it's a game changer. It, it's going to change their lives forever. That this affects your ability to get employed. You, in the United States, you get reported on what's called the National Predators List because you've been trafficking in child pornography. So there's, there's an obligation to report. Um, you are on that list that is got GPS tags as to where your home is. You are identified. Sometimes people walk around neighborhoods and post up posters as to what kind of person is living in this neighborhood, and that's their right to do that. Um, so this is a, <laughs> I was talking about the power of what's happening in sexting as an epidemic and the potential consequences of that, which is, which is real, happening at, at, at every single day in volumes and volumes of pictures. Live streaming is the next area, which is very, very dangerous. And a, a physical record in a video, and now I talk about the legal entanglements about it being the parent's responsibility. So remember I mentioned that I'm not trying to apply any judgment on this at all because this isn't a judgment issue. I was on a social media platform today where somebody had a very strong opinion that certain sexual behavior is normal and acceptable and you should let kids be able to video, to shoot video of themselves having sex. And that's, that's his particular perspective. And that may be his perspective, but the law says that that is not appropriate behavior. So if it happens and he gets caught, then he's breaking the law. So I don't want to impose any moral statements on this. I have them. I'm talking about the, the consequences of it. The consequences of breaking the law and doing something as bad as that has long-term consequences. So where I said earlier that I think we're all aligned with the same objective to raise children to be safe so that they will be equipped to be resilient when they become 18 years old and go out. We want to keep our eyes on those things that are going to undermine them or distract them from that. So the distractions that are working as an opposite force to our parental goals of keeping them safe, making them resilient to go out and be successful, productive citizens, those distractions are our peer groups, their peer groups, their peer groups are going to take them away from an objective that we may have, or we may have a peer group that is supporting our objective. That's very possible too. The other is the internet. Whatever is happening on the other side of that communication could be contrary to our objectives. So um, I wanted to, to put out that communication again. If you have any questions you want to comment, you can come in at 919-518-9773, or you can come in via Skype at Computers2KVoice. So this is Ryan Miller from Parent Dome, and I constantly talk about how to keep kids safe on the internet, drawing attention to awareness, talking about oversight, and eyes on what is happening on, on your kids' digital media, and then hard level controls. So I, I went over a couple of different, different areas. I, I took a path to you guys to get to know me a little bit more personally. Um, I wanted to bring in what was happening as a byproduct of what, what happened in, in Paris on Friday, um, and how that had some consequences on the social media platforms and that it elevated the communication that was happening on social media to the point where there was a lot of unfriending and deleting happening. But I also draw the correlation to our own behavior that we may have been participating in that. And I'm, I'm pointing to myself. I, I was participating in that social media. 
I chose not to take some of the bait that was out there, and I wound up being more of a spectator than a participant. But I knew I could have easily gotten involved in the participant side. But I knew that my participation, one, is a visibility into what my relationship with my wife is like, is to, I don't, I don't want to have this uh, perception that this is the way I am or my real relationship out there is not this person speaking over here. So I don't want to do that. And then the other piece is that it, whatever we may have been doing is an example that we're leaving for our children as to what may or may not be appropriate behavior. And it's, there's, there's often this um, statement that, that there's, it's a hypocrisy or it's a double standard. And I, I say we, that the word hypocrisy doesn't, doesn't fit anymore. There's two standards, the double standard. And it's the standard which I have for myself, which I may permit myself to do certain things on social media, but the other standard is the standard that I hold for my child. Well, it's really unfair to have a standard for my child, which is not a standard in which I'm willing to adhere to myself. It's kind of like the, the, the kind of business owner do you want to work for? Do you want to work for the business owner that points to the, the broom and says, sweep that, or are you going to get the, or are you going to be better with the business owner that's, that grabs the broom himself and stands beside you and says, let's sweep together. There's those that say, go, and then the others that stand at the front say, let's go. So I'm, I'm saying the double standard has been there for a long time, that we stand at one place and we say, we give ourselves permission because we're mature and wiser that we can do these certain things, but the standard over here for our child is completely different. Um, so I, I thank you for, uh, for staying and, and watching. I'm going to continue to do these episodes. I apologize for the technical difficulties that began earlier. I hope everybody has an enjoyable, enjoyable weekend. And I ask that you uh, work with your kids to be aware of their dangers, to work to have eyes on the things that they're doing, and explore the different level of controls that you can have. Because I've got to tell you, it's a lot easier to let the phone shut off at 9 o'clock as opposed to say, honey, get off the phone. Oh, you're five minutes late. Honey, get off the phone. Oh, it's 10 minutes late. Get off the phone. Stop. Let the device shut it off for you. That's the part of the controls. And those are just little minor steps. All of that stuff is based upon family dynamics and your relationship with your children that are emotionally and responsibility. And it's all to have a better life in this digital world. So thank you very much. This is Ryan, and I will see you next week. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Health In with Debbie Brooke, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, The Tanya Love Show, Your Healthy Pet with Gisela DiCarlo. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by Atomus.com makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals. CarolinaApparel.com and DeltaForce.net.